Well, I'll tell you what, this has definitely been a, a much awaited, uh, a very much awaited chapter coming up from what I can see. Uh, one of the foundational uh, principles of uh, Christianity stems from this, from this very chapter. So uh, incredibly excited to, to hear the storyline and how things work. You said something one time in one of your lectures, and I'm hoping you to revisit that idea again during this. And, and um, I don't know if I heard it on your uh, on the, your, your website. Uh, speaking of which, outreachjudaism.org. You can go there to listen to all of his podcasts on just about everything, including Isaiah, Jeremiah, anything he's got. But you said something that was really interesting about a sign and about this lady had this idea with the city. Remember that? With the speed limit signs and things like that? Sure. Okay, yeah, so that, that was, that was while well, I was sitting there listening, I was like, what the heck is he saying? Like, oh my gosh, that is brilliant. So you got to bring us into that again today. That'd be great. So, <laughs> okay, Rabbi. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. So have fun with it, and I'll try to follow you along. Let me know when to pop up your, uh, your images, and I'll try to follow along with the Bible as well, okay? Thank you so much. I, I'll tell you a very interesting thing. Uh, the, the, the comment I made was in a lecture about 23 years ago in San Antonio, Texas. And I literally just recalled the, I just recalled it, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll explore it today. But, uh, but uh, you know, as I mentioned to you, as we mentioned, we are now in the fifth part of this series. And as we've mentioned before, some chapters just require uh, two or three broadcasts, one-hour broadcasts, and sometimes we can do two or three chapters in one broadcast. I I'll just very briefly mention something, and I'm going to say this almost in every part, every segment of the book of Isaiah, because if you don't know this, you cannot even begin to understand Isaiah. And in fact, I will say, if you don't understand the book of Isaiah, and I, when I say understand the whole book of Isaiah, know that you're in good company because unless you are very familiar with Samuel Kings and Chronicles and major segments of the book of Psalms, you will not understand the book of Isaiah. And one of the challenges of the book of Isaiah is, unlike Joshua, unlike the Torah, unlike Judges, the book of Judges, unlike Samuel and Kings, which follow a chronology, a general chronology, there are exceptions, but those are, that is not the norm. They follow a basic chronology. They skip periods that are unimportant because remember, we are not studying history books. We are studying holy works that are divinely inspired in the Word of God. And therefore, if you want to read history books, you can read Paul Johnson, my favorite historian, Barbara Tuckman. They're all out there. But those are not holy books. But they give you copious details of historical events. But that's not what Tanakh is interested in. One point, as I mentioned, that's vital for me to share with you again is Isaiah is the first book of what are called the Latter Prophets. Latter here does not really mean that every book of all the 15 books of the Latter Prophets, which begin with Isaiah and end with Malachi, are actually chronologically later than the earlier prophets, namely Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, but rather... They're a very different style. Uh, there are events described here in the chapters that we're discussing that, in fact, take place before events in the earlier prophets. So it's very important. Now, one other point I must say, I, and I, I say it, but God forbid you don't know this, you'll never touch Isaiah. Isaiah is not written in chronology. Isaiah has the book of Isaiah was written by a prophet who had no interest whatsoever in, in following chronology, none. He's interested in conveying a message, and that is how to live your life, and he does that by demonstrating to you the most grievous errors of the past, and then juxtaposing that 
with messianic prophecy. If you want to understand why harsh criticism is coupled together with ecstatic messianic prophecy, in fact, the most ecstatic messianic prophecy is found in the book of Isaiah. It's in, also the, the writing style of Isaiah is really unparalleled. If you, in a university, if you study by academics, they will use Isaiah as an example of the best literary uh, devices uh, known throughout Scripture. But one thing is very important is Isaiah has no interest in chronology. And in fact, he will skip many, many years. He will go back and forth. But there's a theological reason why he does that. And of course, the purpose of this broadcast is not to tell you what you can read on your own. If you just open Isaiah, and in all likelihood, you'll probably get lost very, very quickly, but rather to, sh to lift up the layer and go underneath. Very much like, you know, if you, if you have a, a computer, Lahavdil, right? So you get a nice computer from whatever manufacturer, and it looks, comes in a beautiful shell, a nice case, a nice laptop, beautiful everything. But if you take a screwdriver and remove the top and the bottom, you're looking at the wiring and you're looking at the guts of it. That's what we're really doing here. Okay, that is that I, I need to remove the shell so you understand what is occurring, what is taking place here. And, in f and I also implore you, if you want to understand why there is harsh criticism coupled with messianic prophecy, why are they married together? And that's not just Isaiah, it's Ezekiel, Jeremiah, it's everywhere. Go to part two of Isaiah. We're not going to cover that here. We've covered that extensively, okay? And in fact, we are from the last segment, we, we explored the sixth chapter of Isaiah. It's, we did that in two uh, broadcasts because, and that's really chronologically the first event in Isaiah's prophetic career. Again, why? go to section 3 and 4 with 3 and 4, 3b but not here but here's what you must know, and that is that although a moment ago that means in the last show in Isaiah 6, we were exploring an event that occurred in the 27th year of a 52 reign, year reign of Uziahu, also known as Azariah in fact, when we go from chapter 6 to chapter 7, we're just going to skip a massive amount of, of time because Isaiah is not a history book. So therefore, the last 25 years of Uzziah's life, you'll find it in Chronicles, in Second Chronicles 26, 27, 28, and so on. You can look at there. You look at it in Kings and so on. Isaiah is not interested in it here. Now, just so you know what is being skipped, because Isaiah, by the way, Isaiah's name, if Isaiah was standing on the street and he said, excuse me, Isaiah, he would not turn around, because Isaiah is, is not his name. This is a Anglicanized name. His name is Yeshayahu, which means the salvation of our God. And therefore, know this, my sweet children of the Most High, Everything in the book of Isaiah is ultimately messianic, is, deals with the salvation of the Jewish people. But as, you will, as many of you know, or are about to find out, these texts are, are misused and have been abused by religions, and successfully so, and unfortunately good people misunderstand what Isaiah is conveying. One other point, because Isaiah is skipping the last 20, right here, is skipping the last 25 years of Uzio's career as king. He's skipping entirely the 16-year career of Yotam, who's barely mentioned, a righteous king, not interested. And he's then moving to Ahaz, who is now 
coming into view. That's the grandson of Uziahu, the grandson of the king who got leprosy in chapter 6. We're moving an enormous amount of distance of time. Know that. So we've, we've gone from Uziahu right in the middle of his, his reign. If you want to know about that part, look at uh, section 3 and 4 of our broadcast. But now we're in the kingship of Ahaz. Okay, quick question. From chapter yeah. 6 to chapter 7, as you stated, chapter 6 is more chrono chron chronologically chapter 1. So is It is chapter 1, right. Chronologically. Is 7 following in that footstep, or is it kind of... No, not at all. It is all over the place. There is a reason for it, and I'll explain, like I did in the past, why is chapter 6 really chronologically the first? Why is chapter 1 really not chronologically the first? In past shows, I've explained to you, in fact, in the last show, I explained to you why it was switched around. We, I'm going to always be doing that with you. You've got to know there's a reason behind it. There, there is an advantage, however, to studying Isaiah than books like, than holy books like Samuel and Kings. What's the you go? What do you mean with advantage? Samuel Kings, I'm looking at gripping stories that are easy to understand. They follow a narrative, the stories are powerful. Here, I'm like going, what's going on? How could you possibly think that Isaiah in a way is easier? And the reason for this is that because Isaiah does not follow a chronology, and he is just moving from one place to another, and it is explosive in ecstatic prophetic language, there is no way in the world that you can misunderstand Isaiah as the Word of God. We're, although, when studying Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, the stories are so gripping, so powerful, that you almost forget that this is the Word of God, and this is a holy book. It's almost like you're reading a history book. Disturbing events, but history nonetheless. And Isaiah, you can't be seduced into that. And therefore, Isaiah is, has an advantage where you've got to stop and ask, what is going on here, okay? So that's the advantage of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, at all. The lot of prophets, you know you are being slammed with, with intense proph prophetic work that is the Word of God. Final question, and then I'm going to turn it completely over. Is it necessary for uh, for us to know the other prophets to, to fully understand Isaiah? Does yes, yes. I am. I am not me, great Tovia singer. It, what our sages of blessed memory have done is that if you want to spend fifty years studying all these texts, of course. And you, you need a teacher, but if you study all the texts, you, you'll be able to assemble it. What the commentaries are doing is they're not really telling you stuff that's not in Scripture. Generally, there are a few midrashic pieces of information that fill in spaces. Of course there are. But what really we're doing on this show is it's, it's like you're getting baby food, meaning... It's all cooked for you. I'm going to bring in for you the cha other chapters in the Bible from different books to fill in the spaces so that you understand what's going on. Because if you don't know what's going on, like you don't know what the Davidic kingdom of, and the kingdom of Israel is, you can never understand this chapter. But in order to understand the, the division of the southern and the northern kingdom, you need the book of Kings. You need Chronicles, right? So that you have, it's not that you won't get it completely, or you'll get it 80%. If you only read the book of Isaiah, you would just stare and go, I give up. And that would take about 15 minutes. Not even, if you're good. Usually people will close it within three minutes. Now, uh, alternatively, most people will read a verse here from Isaiah, a verse there from Isaiah, but they have no idea what the context is. And you know how much trouble you'll be in. Dr. King, a blessed memory, he was murdered in April of 1968. He quoted in, in his many speeches... Uh, he quoted Isaiah up and down because Isaiah is so breathtaking. I mean, Dr. King of Blessed Memory is uh, a very special person. But people do know very famous passages of Isaiah, but to go from beginning to an end of a chapter and then say, 
what is happening, why it's happening, why it's here. Why is this story important? There weren't other problems? No, this is the big one. And you're not going to find out actually in why this chapter is here and why the crisis we are, that is now going to come into view. What does this have to do with the redemption? Okay? You'll know. But right now, we're going to hold that off because you won't even understand that until we, we move a little further. Okay? Perfect. Very good. Thank you, Rabbi. I'm going to turn it over completely to you now. Um, for all your viewers who are viewing in for the first time, you got to go back and watch the other three uh, episodes, or four, four, technically. We had well, one, two, three, and then three A. So, um, yeah, this is this is getting more juicy by the minute. So, Rabbi, it's all yours. Okay. So, in order to even begin seven, now, Isaiah chapter seven, uh, no, is contains the most debated passage in the entire Jewish Bible. And that's the famous Isaiah 714, which the author of the book of Matthew, we don't know who he is, but he will quote it or misquote it, will examine that in Matthew 123 to demonstrate that the Messiah was born of a virgin. That's why this is very famous in uh, Jewish Christian polemics. But you're going, tell me about it. You're going to have to wait. Why? You'll understand. You're going to have to trust me for now. Let's back up first the history. Without the history, you can go home, okay? Understand, and this might surprise some people, but the greatest years of the Davidic reign was the 80 years of David and Solomon, 40 years each. When Solomon, a blessed memory, a prophet, an author of three books in Scripture, passed away, he had a son. I'm going to very briefly touch on this, too briefly, but we just simply have too much ground to cover to spend much time on this. This, is, this information is very accessible. I write about it. It's, it's all over the place. And that is that simply, so I'm cutting out a lot, but key is King Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, and his son, Rehavam, you know, you, sometimes people are wondering, your dad, I don't want to get into politics. As long as you have a, a political figure, uh, and he was great, and his son turned out to be, what a disaster. Like, how do you get, like, a disaster from such a great guy? Your dad was so fabulous. How did you turn such a disaster? Well, Rehavam was such a disaster. With a father like Solomon, you'd think he would have done well, but he didn't. Very, in the one-minute version, King Solomon built the first temple. He built, he, everything. You know, Yushalayim, the whole everything. But it was an expensive ordeal. It, there were heavy taxes that were laden on the Jewish people in order to make it possible for Solomon's temple to be built. When Solomon passed away, and his son took over, Rehavam, the Jews were asked that there should be, that taxes should be lowered. This is something that every person uh, from, is familiar with, whether you're American or whatever. Lower taxes, that means it's enough, it's too much. What happened basically was, again, oversimplifying, but it's enough for you to understand the chapter. Rehavam went to the sages, We'll say the rabbis, meaning the spiritual leaders of the time, and they told him, go to the people and tell them things are going to be made easy for you. Be mef- that means comfort them and know that things are made easy. And then the disaster happens. The Chavam then turns to his... Now, he's a young man. He was a, he was a kid. He then... Because remember, his father died at 52. Solomon didn't live as long as David. He then turned to his peers who were youngsters like him, and his peers were hotheads, and they said to him, don't give in. If you, I'm, This is a paraphrase, but if you give the people a finger, they'll want a hand. Don't give in. And a tragedy of tragedies occurred that Rehavam didn't listen to the elders of Israel, but rather he listened to his young buddies, and he, he told the Jews, you're not getting, not only aren't you getting relief, but it's now you're really going to get it. And this caused the split. This is not the only reason for the split, but this was the... This takes place, according to 
This is not Jewish chronology, but let's say um, 2900, some 2,900 years ago. And this causes the Jewish, this schism, this fight, causes the, the Jewish people to become two kingdoms, to divide into two kingdoms. There are many names assigned for these two kingdoms, but you need to know this. One are the, the those who were loyal to Rehavim. That means he was from the house of David. So who was loyal to him and did not rebel in spite of his foolish uh, response to the plea of the people was obviously his own tribe, Judah, uh, the tribe of Levi, who I am a descendant of, meaning the priests and the Levites, and also part of the tribe of Benjamin. On the other hand, the rest of the Jewish people, which means nine and a half tribes, because Benjamin was split, they split away in the north, led by Ephraim, by a man named Yeruvim ben Nevot. I'm not going to get into it, but it was a disaster. It isn't, by the way, the split wasn't clean, as I just described, meaning there were many people from the northern tribes that actually came down and said, we don't want anything to do with that. We're staying with the house of David. But the key that you must know is that for nearly 200 years, until Assyria would carry away the ten northern tribes, the Jewish people were now split into two kings, and it was a disaster. One other point that I must tell you is that the southern kingdom, which is the kingdom of David, those terms are interchangeable, um, or they're called Yehuda, they had many great kings, like Yotam, uh, like Hezekiah, like Asa, many. The northern kingdom had no righteous kings. Just one was worse than the other. Eventually, Assyria, Assyria, because this was during the Assyrian Empire, is going to carry away the ten northern tribes and going to almost destroy Judah. We'll get to that later on. What happens? Ahaz, now, in order to understand this point, Ahaz is the king here, again, He's the son of Uziyahu. He's, excuse me, the grandson of Uziyahu and the son of Yotam. But these are two great people. And, and Ahaz is wicked beyond your imagination. If you want to know why he was so wicked, how could a person who has an, a, a rabbi for a father and a rabbi for a grandfather, his father was perfect, his grandfather was not perfect, but he was a great man. How did they turn out such a disaster for a grandson? Go to part one of Isaiah. It just, it's just not possible for me to review what's been done. So here we have, now, we, what is the geopolitical situation? The great superpower is the uh, Syria, not Syria, but the Assyrian Empire, which precedes the Babylonian Empire, okay? So Assyria is the mega superpower in this region, okay? China is going on, but they don't care. <laughs> That's, they get that. But the Assyrian Empire is what is germane to us, very important to us. Now, Ahaz was wicked. I, I didn't even know how to tell you how. He, he was so evil, he didn't even want people to go into the temple. He actually locked the temple. He actually went and copied a, a altar used for idolatry. He had his best architects take the blueprints and then build it on the Temple Mount. I mean, you're going, I, I, it, it just, he was evil. And you're going to go, how did he get so evil? Again, part one. No charge, so believe me, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but just for now know that at this moment we have a number of players on the field. If you don't know this, this chapter won't make any sense. So, you have first of all the, the world power, the Assyrian Empire. Now, you have two king, the, the Jewish people, I'm using the word Jewish people generically, okay, because in reality the southern kingdom would be the kingdom of Judah, so this is not, and the northern kingdom is called the kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom is called the Davidic kingdom. The northern kingdom is called the kingdom of Ephraim. There are a lot of names, but be very aware that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were, almost, were often at war. I mean, we're using again the word Jew, which is a contemporaneous term, and we are now 
do not write me an email, they weren't Jews and this was the kingdom of Israel. Because then technically I'm not a Jew. I'm an Israelite. I'm from the tribe of Levi. So what I'm going to do to make this show very easy to understand is I am going to use, unless it interferes with the show, I'm going to use conventional language that we use today. Again, the Jewish people were divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And what's key is the northern kingdom was allied with Syria meaning Damascus, not Assyria. They sound the same. Not only don't they have anything to do with each other, Syria, meaning Aram, was at war with Assyria. They hated each other. Moreover, the northern kingdom was allied with Syria. One other point, what about the southern kingdom? That means, when we say southern kingdom, which means everything south which means Judea. And you're going, where's Judea in Samaria? People ask that question. Where, like, what, where is that? I heard of Judea in Samaria. I mean, could you tell me where that is on a map? So I can. Basically, if you, and if you join me on my tours in November and December, uh, you can write to me. We actually go through and show it to you. But here basically is it. If you take Jerusalem, which is essentially like the belly button, the navel of the land of Israel, what is north of Jerusalem is Samaria, okay, especially the eastern side, and whatever is south is Judea. So Hebron, as an example, is in Judea. It's only a 45-minute drive from Jerusalem. uh, Bet Lechem is in Judea. It's only a 15-minute drive. In the ancient world, it was a multi-day journey. If we go, let's say, to Bet El, which is like a 45-minute drive today. That's where Jacob saw the letter. That's in Benjamin. That's in the northern kingdom, okay? Just so you understand. So basically, what's south of Jerusalem is Judea. What's north is Samaria. It's not exact, but it's good enough for you to work with. What happens? The northern kingdom of Israel, along with Syria, is going, this is not good. Because the southern kingdom, meaning the Davidic house, under this wicked king Ahaz, Ahaz made an alliance with Assyria. And they're going, no way, we do not want the Assyrian Empire to have any influence to extend its its power in this region. And therefore, Ahaz, who is a Davidic king in the southern kingdom, he has to be eliminated. Okay, got it? Now, So therefore, we have two teams, essentially. The two teams are, you have an alliance between the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria, and and then you have in the southern kingdom, you have Ahaz, a very bad man, but he is a descendant of King David. Now that's going to be very important in a moment. He decides, he does not trust God. He does not believe in the God of Israel. He wants nothing to do with the God of Israel. He's going to fake it and make like, he's going to feign piety in a moment. We'll see it. But he does not want God to deliver him. Because God really would deliver him. But he's going, I, I, I'm turning to Assyria to save me. Okay? Now, one other point that you must know, and then we can go right to the text, and the text will make complete sense to you. What happens is is that Ahaz, the king of the southern kingdom, the Davidic king, a direct son of King David, really deserved to be destroyed. He, He did not merit to be saved by God. He deserved to die. And believe me, he would have. But in a sense, Kaviyachal, in a sense... God could not allow him to die and could not allow his kingdom. No matter how evil he was, God was, I'm I'm using in a sense, Kavayachal, God does not break his promise. And God had an IOU note. Not to Ahaz. Ahaz was a bum, as you'll see. But God made a promise to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Verse 12 through 16, and this is called the Davidic Covenant. That's why I say, if you don't know that, you won't understand this. Ahaz is wicked. 
But God has to save him. Why? Because God promised King David centuries earlier that even if you will have children, meaning grandchildren, Enoch, you'll have descendants who are personally wicked, I will punish them with the rod of men, but I will not allow your throne, meaning your dynasty, to be destroyed. Do you got it? So God has to save Ahaz because of promise that he made centuries earlier to King David. It does not mean that God didn't deal with Ahaz spiritually in, in, on the day of judgment, for sure. But on earth, God has to save Ahaz. But on the other hand, Ahaz is going, I don't want God to save me. I can't stand him. I'm going to look for a Siri to help me. So God is going to have to help Ahaz, but the kingdom of David, the, king, the, the house of David, is in huge trouble. Why? Because Jerusalem, which is the center, the capital of the Davidic kingdom, is surrounded by two armies. Army number one is Jews from the northern king because there's been a civil war. And Syria, not us Syria, they have now surrounded Jerusalem. Could you imagine being in Jerusalem and you have two vast armies surrounding you ready to kill your king and wipe out the Davidic house? Could you imagine? What would it have been like to be a Jew loyal to the Davidic house? You were stuck with a, a bum of a king named Ahaz. But you're looking around you and, and, and what, what do you have? You, you, have an, you are doomed. There is no way in the world that you're going to escape this. Now, Ahaz does not want to turn to God for help. Why? He doesn't, he doesn't want anything to do with God. Why? You have to go back to part one of this broadcast. But for right now, no, he doesn't want God. He wants to be like the Marcoses. Remember that from the Philippines? That they escaped. They just wanted to get out and get the Americans to get him out. They didn't want to help. So Ahaz is not interested in God saving him. He's interested in Assyria saving him. And this is the... But as it turns out, God has to save him. And what occurs here in this chapter, chapter 7, is is a massive crisis. According to the chronology of Herodotus, this is taking place, let's say, in, I don't know, um, I don't know, 760 B.C. or so, 740 B.C. or so, okay? That is not in accordance with uh, Jewish crown. I'll just, we'll just leave it there. Now, now we can, now we can approach this chapter. So you get, this is the crisis, because Isaiah, the prophet, the holy man of God, is going to be sent by the Almighty to tell Ahaz everything is going to be okay. God's going to save him. Not because Ahaz deserved it, but God had a promise, and God, the God of Israel, Eh Hashem doesn't break His promise. God Netzach Yisrael lo Yishaker, the God of Israel does not lie. Ki lo Yodem, He's not a man. Li Nochem, He doesn't change his mind. God must save Achaz because the promise to King David. You got that all? If you don't have that, you'll never understand this chapter. So the people of in Jerusalem were shaking, not like a bush, not like grass, but leaves in a tree. What, what's the difference between leaves in the tree and, on, and, and, and grass on the ground? Grass on the ground is just how much could you shake? But if you're a leaf in a tree and there's a hurricane just waving and shooting and one leaf is sitting there, they were going to, it, 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 they were petrified. Incidentally, one other point I will say so you get it. Ahaz was so wicked and he's going to be saved here. We'll see how it's going to happen. But he is held in such derision by the Bible that God, very often the prophet or the Almighty, doesn't even call him Ahaz. He is, but often he's just going to be called you house of David. Why is he called you house of David? This is why I cover everything so when we get to it, you'll understand this. Because you probably figured out the answer. Ahaz, as Ahaz, he didn't deserve to be saved. What did he do? He was a low light. He was terrible. I mean, if you knew how bad he was, you'd be shocked. He was a very bad man. But he's called the house of David. That's how he's referred to often, not always. Why? Because the only reason he's being saved is not because he's Ahaz. For his own sake, he would have been thrown away like garbage. But his, the only reason why God is going to intervene for Ahaz is because the promise of the house of David. You got it? 
Good. Let's now take a look at this, and now everything will make sense to you. What's going to happen is that the first word, incidentally, I just teach you this and we'll go quicker in the English because I don't want to, but the first word of this chapter is Vayihi, Vayihi bimei Achaz ben Yotam. It was in the days of Achaz, the son of Yotam, ben Uzziahu. Now, you should know that a, a text, a, his, a text that is a historical text, can begin with Vayihi, and it was, or it said Vahoya, which basically is the same thing, and it was. But here's a little point that you should know in the scripture in general. When the, when the story is being introduced, and it starts with Vayihi, in Vayihi Bimei, like, like in the book of Esther, it was in the days of Achashayash, it means this is a bad story. Okay? Generally. When it says Vahoya, then it means that we're going to introduce a very uplifting story. So right away, if you ever open a chapter in the Bible, and it says, by he be may, and it was in the days, <laughs> hang on, okay? That means, it's a, when you say bad, it doesn't mean bad in a conventional sense, but the events that are about to unfold are very tragic. Of course, everything turns out well because God made a promise. But just see, I want you to know this, and then we're going to move through because I want to get to the germane text. And it was in the days of Ahaz, and and in fact, it, it says who was the son of Yotam. Yotam was perfect. Yotam was the greatest king in terms of sin. The man never sinned as king. Never. 16 years, didn't do a thing wrong. Almost nothing about him in the Bible. His grandfather, Zuzia, who I told you about, what happened? That two king or kingdoms rose up against him. One is called, one king, his name is Ritsin. Ritsin is the king of Syria. Now, who's the other king? Who's the king of the northern kingdom of Israel? And then is Pekah, the son of Ramalia. Okay? So, therefore, his name is Pekah, the son of ben Ramalia. So, these two kingdoms, Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel, are now going to war against the southern kingdom because they don't like the alliance of Assyria. Okay? That's the story that's going on. And they went to wage war to Yishlaim, and this is, by the way, so you're not confused, it says that they ultimately failed. This is very common, as famously in Daniel 9, that in Scripture, very often it tells you how it ends right away, and then, that means it says they went to war, and ultimately they, they weren't successful, and then it backs up, it says, let me give you the whole story. As you can imagine, the people of the house of David were shaking two massive kings, two massive armies are surrounding. This is bad, bad news. God instructs Isaiah, Yeshayahu Hanovi, who was a, a holy man, he says, go out to Ahaz and bring your son with you. His name is Shar Yashuv. We're going to go in a moment to this, why is Isaiah told to bring his family? In fact, Isaiah's wife is going to be there too. Now, as it turns out, this son, Shar Yashiv, which is a famous name, it means the remnant will be, will be protected, will remain. This son is never mentioned again in the Bible. Now, whenever you look at Scripture, and you're going, uh, and you're wondering, oh, why is it, like, is it like, oh, and it happened, and last he came, and the mailman was it? There's no such thing in the Bible. Nothing like that. If Isaiah says, take your family, and, he, and the son, Shari Yashiv, is mentioned, there's not one extra letter in Scripture. It's there for a reason. The reason is, is the name Shari Yashiv means that the remnant will remain. Meaning Isaiah's, um, Isaiah's mandate by God, God is sending him to tell Ahaz it's going to be okay. Okay? That's what happens. Isaiah is sent to tell Ahaz that actually God is going to save you. As I said, not because you're good, but because... Okay? But he says, he says, bring your family and make sure Shai Yashiv is with you. Why? Why? That means, why? Why is it there? It's there because, as you'll see, the names of the prophets were not just, hi, you take your son Shmuel, take your son Charlie with you. No. It's there because this son's name is a portent for what's going to happen to the Davidic kingdom. Namely, they're going to be saved. 
It's very important. Now, we'll, we'll cross this. We'll put the, this will all come together for you in this show and the show that follows. Watch carefully. Now, what, what happened? Because, remember, the, uh, the house of David is terrified. You read it. The, the, the house of David is... I mean, imagine you're in Jerusalem. You're surrounded by two massive armies. You're going to die. Okay? So the people are terrified. Now, what happened is, I'm not going to go into detail, but there's also another seemingly vestigial piece of information. Isaiah finds Ahaz, the king, in the laundry mat. Now, it doesn't mean there was laundry mats, but in the ancient world, when people, when your clothes were soiled, you didn't have washing machines, so women would, I, I presume, women would presume, would surely be women, would go down to a stream where there were rocks, and they would wash the clothing against the rocks. Uh, I've been in Papua New Guinea in the jungles. They still do it to this day. The point of the matter is that, as you can imagine, a place where people are washing dirty clothing is not exactly the most bakovadika place, meaning the most honorable place. Why is this in the Bible? Because this is what actually happens. Again, I'm just bringing it all together. Imagine Ahaz. <laughs> A wicked, wicked Ahaz, he gets word, you know who's coming? The greatest rabbi prophet in the whole world. And Ahaz is a stinker. Ahaz spends every night in Las Vegas, okay? That's a paraphrase, but he's the worst guy in the world. But the greatest, greatest, greatest prophet in the whole world, there were many great people, Isaiah was way up to the, the giant of the generation is coming, so what does Ahaz do? He's going, i got to get out of here. He's normally in the palace. If you want to know where his palace was, it was in the city of David, in, right south of the old city of Jerusalem. But imagine you're the king, and you're a bad guy, and you know you're a bad guy. You've got gambling and crap tables going on. Lord only knows you have idolatry everywhere. But then you hear the greatest Jew alive is coming. So what do you do? Even if you have any you know, any, anything at all, you're like, oh my God, I got to get out of here. Like, imagine, imagine, let's say a person's not faithful, so they're in some house of prostitution with, with poker games going on and tr people smoking crack or whatever, but then you find out the greatest rabbi in the world is coming, so they go, oh my God, and you just, just hide somewhere, and that's what happens. Ahaz ran to a place that no king would go, to the washer's field. Now, what happens is God says to Isaiah, <laughs> I want you to get the scene. God says to Isaiah, and again, I'm filling in passages, time is limited. Uh, by the way, if you're going to find him, go to the washer's field, because that's where he's hiding from you, okay? So now you get the picture of why these words are here. And I, and. And Isaiah says to Ahaz, in this very unbecoming place, says to him, you don't have to worry. Why? Yes, logic would tell you that you are doomed, surrounded by two enemies that are going to destroy you. But as it turns out, HaKadosh, the Almighty is going to save you, and this king, Ritzin, uh, Pekach, and, and Ritzin, meaning the, king, the northern kingdom of Israel and the king of Syria, they're going to be destroyed. And they were, in fact, assassinated. So you have nothing to worry about. Don't worry. Okay? So therefore, put your trust in God. Now, Ahaz is, imagine the scene. Ahaz is there, embarrassed out of his skull. He's in a, in a laundry room of the ancient world. Okay? And Isaiah is saying to him, don't worry. And Ahaz is going, don't worry. Yeah, right. I need Assyria fast, and I'm not interested in signs or anything. But he fakes it, because nobody... When you, when you stood before Isaiah, I don't care who you were, <laughs> even if you're the lowest person in front of Isaiah, you just... You could be the head of 15 casinos, but you're standing in front of Isaiah. So Isaiah, so Ahaz 
feigns piety. And he goes, when Isaiah says, God is going to show you a sign so you know that although things look horrible, that's a paraphrase, incidentally, although the situation looks like it's an impending disaster, there's no hope, but as it turns out, ask for any sign you want. Ask for a sign from above or below, and God will show you a sign so you should know that God, you will be saved miraculously. Again, why? Because God made already promised King David. Now, what happens? Isaiah in Achaz, excuse me, in verse 12 says, he says, he says these words, Vayoyma Achaz, Achaz says, Loi eshal v'loi anase es Hashem. Which means, I i don't want to do that. That's not nice. I don't want to ask anything of the Lord. I don't want to uh, test the Lord. And what a fake he is. So he's feigning total piety. Now Isaiah, of course, is a prophet. Now Isaiah is listening to this bulvan. It's a Yiddish word, meaning this, this boorish king, this disaster, one of the worst. And Isaiah turns to him and says, <laughs> you don't want to test God? You think, I don't know what you're up to? Okay. And Isaiah, and, he, and this is the language Isaiah uses. We're going now to uh, verse 13. He says, Vayoymer, he says, Vayoymer, he says, Shimu no based of it. Listen, O house of David. This is what I told you. He doesn't call him Ahaz. Why? Because doesn't deserve it. I wanted to show you, by the way, one thing. I'm going to step back. I apologize, apologize, but this is a big point I forgot to mention. When Isaiah and Ahaz are speaking, Isaiah the prophet, Ahaz the bad, evil king, the fake, the king who's feigning piety, take a look at verse 10. Everyone misses this. Isaiah is talking to Ahaz, and he says to Ahaz, he says, he says to him, ask, ask, um, uh, request any sign for yourself from a uh, request it from the death from below or up ask anything you want and God will show you something but look at look at the, what it says actually either in Hebrew or in the translation doesn't make a sense it says there in verse 10 Vayosef Hashem Daber El Ochoz Lemur it doesn't say Isaiah said to Achaz it says God and it's the ineffable name of God said back to Achaz and you, you, if you don't notice this, my friends, jump out the window. You missed it. Did you hear what just happened? Please look it up. In Isaiah 7.10, I, I skipped it in my apologies. In Isaiah 7.10, Isaiah is speaking to Achaz. He's saying, answer any sign. But if you look at the text, it says, and God said to Achaz. What do you mean God said to Achaz? God doesn't talk to Ahaz. Ahaz is no prophet. But because Isaiah is speaking in the name of Hashem, Isaiah is called God. This is what trips everyone up. But look it up. Ahaz is not hearing from God. Ahaz is hearing from Isaiah. Isaiah is speaking the word of God. And because he's speaking in the word of God, he's called God. Hashem Daber And God said to Ahaz, but Isaiah was speaking. And this is what all, forgive me all the Christians, don't be angry at me, this is where you all get in trouble. Everyone flops all over the place. In the Bible, when prophets are spoken of or spoke or addressed or are speaking, when angels are speaking, when judges are speaking, please read Exodus 21, 22 yourself, they're called God. This is not the way people talk today, but this is the way Bible speaks. And if you want to get in trouble, impose conventional linguistics and conventional the, 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 the normative speech, go and pose it on the Word of God, and you will find yourself worshiping idols. So very important, this illustrates, and this is, by the way, unassailable, because the word there is the uneffable name of God. Isaiah is called God. God, period. God was talking, Isaiah is talking. And this is why when Jacob was wrestling, it says with Eli, with, with Elohim, it's really an angel. Ah, everyone, all of are jumping. That ah, says God, because you don't get it. Anyone who represents God is called God. Okay? We'll stop there. But we'll, I don't going to go further because we have to get to the meat. But this is one of the major, major illustrations of this. So what happens is that Isaiah turns back to 
a hardly says to him. <laughs> he says to him. Because now the faking stops. Isaiah says, it's not enough that you make trouble for man, meaning for prophets. You give me such a... I'm just paraphrasing. You test man, meaning you... You mess with the prophets. You're so unobedient. You're now going to start trouble with God too? I mean, who do you think you're fooling with your feigned piety? And here comes the most amazing verse. This verse is a prophecy. It's not only not this verse, but actually the next three verses, there's a prophecy that when you will know, when the two kings, the king of, of Israel and the king of Syria, that they'll be destroyed. Here's your sign, okay? So, again, Ahaz is in trouble. Isaiah is going, Ahaz is going, I don't want to test God. Isaiah says, you're a faker. Now I'm going to show you when these two kings are going to be destroyed. And now we have the most famous verse that was molested by the church. Molested, is that a strong word? It's not strong enough. It's not strong enough. What, what the book of Matthew did to this text, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it alone. But this is, this is what was done to our Bible. This is only one example. It's the most famous example. It says here, Behold, the Lord of his own will in fact give you a sign. What is the sign? So it goes like this. Which means... Behold the young woman. Behold the young woman. Now, imagine we're again in the washer's field. Isaiah's brought his family, including his kid, his wife. Isaiah's point to his, his wife and goes, Behold the young woman is with the child. I mean, she is in Yiddish trogadik. She is pregnant. The Yoled Bain, and she will bear a son. The Kara Shemai, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, by the way, like we remember Shar Yashiv, Emmanuel, these names, Emmanuel means God is with us. What does that mean? It means that God is going to protect the southern kingdom. But wait, that's not the sign. Well, what do I do? She's pregnant now. At what point? In in the third trimester? In the four, in the fourth month? In the two hundredth day of her pregnancy? When exactly is this going to happen? And that's verse fifteen and sixteen. Watch very carefully at fifteen and Isaiah seven fifteen and sixteen, because people think again, Christians. They mean well. I don't mean every Christian. There are a lot of we all have lunatics, but Christians mean well, but this is all they know, because this is what they taught in the church. But here, let's go to the Word of God. So now we're told about the Son. Now, if now we're going to be told, that means the, the woman, the young woman is pregnant, but is it happening in 10 minutes? Is it happening the moment she gives birth? Is it happening when the, when the child is 6 months old, 18 months old? When? And the sign is now... Look at verse 15. He will eat cream and honey when he knows to reject evil and choose good. What does that mean? If you're a Christian watching this show, please tell me what that means. I don't mean this, God forbid, in a disrespectful way, but why doesn't the church teach this? Because people just read cream and honey, shall eat. Food. What does that mean, cream and honey, he'll eat pizza and black olives? Like, what does that have to do with anything? But now what you've heard, well, this will all make sense, and that is cream and honey are what? If you're under siege, are you eating cream? No. You're lucky if you can get a glass of milk. You're not going to churn it and make it into cream. You're not going to cultivate beans, bees and make honey. You're eating bread and water if you're lucky. So, therefore... This child who's inside this one mother's womb now, this child will be eating cream and honey, meaning that the siege will be done when the child matures enough to know, that, to, know to reject bad and choose good, which a baby can't do, but a, a small child can do already. And how do you know what I just said is true? Maybe Rabbi Singer made it up because I don't like, I got into a fight with a Christian 10 years ago. No. Let's write the next verse. For before the child, I mean, in case you just have any doubt at all, for before the child will know to reject evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you, whom you fear 
will be abandoned. Okay? Therefore, it's very clear. That means before a child knows the difference between good and evil, these, the, that means that's how young the child will be. How old is a child that knows good and evil? What is it? Two years, three years, two years old. He'll see the next chapter. I'm not going to go there now. They're actually, even before the child knows, say, mommy, daddy. How old is a child before he can say, mommy, daddy? Pretty young. That means it's, it's happening imminently. And now along comes Matthew. This is what you're all waiting for, and you had to wait to the end. Now you see how preposterous this is. Matthew, is, it turns out there are 27 uh, books in the Christian Bible, but only two of them, two out of 27, consider that there is anything unusual about Jesus' conception, his birth, of the city in which he was born. And that's a, the book of Matthew and Luke. They're going to use different plot devices to get him to be born in Bethlehem. We're not going there now. But the key point is, Matthew is different than Luke. We don't know who wrote Matthew, but one thing is for sure, whoever wrote Matthew wants to convince Jews that they should become Christians. Matthew, therefore, will be the greatest disaster in church history in that because he will misquote the Jewish scriptures, and Luke generally does not, he will ensure that Jews will resist conversion to Christianity if they know anything. It's one of the great ironies of history. Matthew's purpose, again, we don't know where Matthew is written. Everything you think you know about where Matthew is written is a is a Catholic tradition from the second century, but you can be one thing we can say, whoever wrote it intended to convert Jews to Christianity because he's going to repeatedly quote from the Jewish Bible using what's called fulfillment citations. There are 11 of them. This is the most famous of the 11. And Matthew will change, will use this text, but will change the words completely in order to make them appear Christological. The text says, I'm going back now, and this is what we're going to concentrate the next 15 minutes on. Okay, I'm going to show you what Matthew did to this. And it'll, it'll help if you have them side by side. I'll, we'll put them up on the screen for you. Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1, after we have the genealogy that stretches to verse 16, and then 17, which I'm not going to get into, but when we get to verse 21, 22, we are told, uh, Joseph is told that, in fact, Mary's going to have a baby, and she wasn't uh, unfaithful to him, and even Joseph is going, what do you mean? But I know, I know, no one ever slept with her. No, in fact, uh, the child is born of a virgin, and this is, and, and this is not an and he's, he'll be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This is not an accident. Matthew claims, Matthew insists, Matthew argues, and Jews for Jesus argues, and Chosen People Ministries argues, and the Southern Baptist Convention argues, and the Roman Catholic Church. They all, the whole church argues, this is not an accident. The Messiah is to be conceived of a virgin. But it was foretold in the book of Isaiah. But in order, please, if you have a, 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 a Jewish Bible done properly, it means, not even properly, just not done by, you know, them, but done by properly. I mean, I wish you could read Hebrew, but the Hebrew says, the Lord will give, behold, the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the young woman, he nay ho alma. Behold, the young woman is with a child, and she will call his name Emmanuel. That is not interesting. Why? There's nothing about virgins. There's nothing about, no, there's nothing in there Christological. And, but what does Matthew do? He changes it. And please look it up for yourself. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Matthew says, uh, as the, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Do you know how many changes were made in that text? Number one, there is no mention of a virgin anywhere in this text. There is only one way in both biblical and modern Hebrew to convey certain virginity, and that's the word betulah. Any Israeli knows this. In fact, this is a Semitic word. It's the only way to do that. The word Alma means a young woman. As it turns out, young women are the types of 
human beings that have babies, in contrast to old women or young men. An Alma means a young woman. Just like in English, it means a young woman. It's, it just it conveys age gender, meaning young and female. It has nothing to do with virginity, meaning sexual history. You could be 80 years old and be a virgin. So they're not related. Be like, ah, no, it's not true. And incidentally, you find an example in Proverbs um, 30, 19, 20, where you have an Alma who happens to be an adulterous woman. Please look it up for yourself. You have in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 56, and 20, verse 22, where, because you have the masculine of it as well. Where King David is called an Elam. Elam Alma is the same word. Alma is a female young woman, and Elam is a male, a young man. What, David was a virgin? How stupid. No one quotes it, but please, again, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 56, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 22. Please look it up for yourself. Second, Isaiah is speaking to Ahaz. Okay? And he's speaking about a woman familiar to both of them. She's right there. Therefore, a definite article is employed. If I say a table or a woman, it could be any woman. If I say the young woman, I'm pointing to the person. If that, By the way, that the way in Hebrew you say the, there's no word for an indefinite article in Hebrew, but there are definite article there sure is. And that is you put a hey in the beginning. That hey, like ho alma, so the root is alma, ho alma means the young woman. This is as basic Hebrew as, like this you learn within, you know, a, a three-year-old learns this in nursery school. The hey, this hey, which is the definite article, it's a prefix rather than a separate word as in the Indo-European language, um, this hey is actually called, what is the name of this, what is the description of this, uh, of, of this um, device, this linguistic device? It's called the hey hayadia, the hey that tells you it is known. That's what it means, hey hayadia. Now, Matthew can't leave the the young woman or the virgin. Why? Because if Isaiah, I mean, you realize how ridiculous this is. If Isaiah is talking, selling Ahaz about a woman who's a virgin in 700 years from now, that means they don't know this woman. So uh, Matthew, check it for yourself, changes the to a, behold, a virgin rather than behold, the young woman. The whole story, of course, makes no sense. Now that you understand it, think, Kendallach, wake up, sweet children of the Most High. Do you realize what's happening here? What is occurring here is there's a crisis. We're basically 2,700 and some 30 years ago. Okay, that's where we are in time, roughly. Isaiah is coming to Ahaz to assure him that the two kings who are threatening, and please read through the chapter for yourself, on your own, I don't care which Bible you use. The key point is the following. Ahaz is in huge trouble. In fact, the Davidic house is about to be, is doomed. But God's going to do a miracle. And the miracle is that the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria are going to be destroyed, and you're going to be miraculously saved. Now, what I'd like to do for you, with you for a moment is, let's try to make sense out of this Christologically, and you'll see how ridiculous this is. What you are being asked to believe by your church is the following. This is what happens. Isaiah says to Ahaz, <laughs> I know you're sweating, you know, you're sweating bullets right now. I know that you're, you're really you're nervous, as you should be. You don't have to worry. What are you worried about? I'll tell you why. I'll give you the sign. You know what? I'll tell you what's going to happen. Don't worry. I know things look horrible. In 700 years, there's going to be a, a, a woman, a virgin, who's going to have a baby named Jesus. And before Jesus, meaning that's, that's what they say he's talking about, before the Messiah, Jesus, before he knows the difference between good and evil, before he matures, these two kings who are threatening your life and kingdom, they'll be destroyed. Does that make any sense to you? I mean, honestly. Now, if you are a Christian listening to the show right now, you obviously want to read it again, because you want to make sure what I'm saying to you is accurate. But if you understood what I've just said, 
you have to right now, if you understand, if you don't understand, you got to think about it. Maybe you got to look it up and triple check it. And I would advise you to do it. Go to your pastor 500 times, go for it. But once you realize that what I have showed you, because Christians don't know Isaiah 7, 1 through 13, as I've shared it with you. They only know this one verse. But if what I've said to you is true, and if you read it for yourself, you realize it is true, then you are should be right now on your phone or on the email, sending in your resignation to your church, and sending another email to the local synagogue saying, I want to join. Immediately. You would never step foot into a church again, and you would make sure that this Sabbath you're in a synagogue, and there's a Big difference between the two. How do you change the Word of God? So, number one, Matthew, I've already shared, and then I'm going to get to the sign part. Matthew, number one, changes a young woman. Young women are the ones who have children, okay? Old women don't have babies. Two is he changes the article for reason. These are not mistakes. These are not whoops. They are very deliberate. Third, I want to ask you a question. It says there, the Koros Shema Emmanuel. You know what that means? It means that she, the karas, is the feminine, meaning the woman, the mommy, she is going to call this child Emmanuel. Problem. You know what the problem is? How many times in the entire Christian Bible does Mary call Jesus Emmanuel? The answer is zero. Never does. Therefore, Matthew has to alter that pronoun and change it to they shall call them Emmanuel. Please look it up for yourself. If I'm telling you the truth, make sure you finish that email to your pastor and make sure you finish that, that phone call to the local rabbi. Say, and then, but more important than the rabbi and the, and the pastor, you right now should be on your, hand, your knees. You should be bowing to the God of Israel if you're a Christian and saying, Lord, forgive me. I have sinned before you. I'm not saying this, God, for to put you down. It's because I care. This is the time now to repent. Because this is, I'm not discussing a mistake. Eh, maybe a scribe made a mistake. This is not a mistake. This is a deliberate alteration of the Jewish scriptures. And lying, God is not a liar. The, the, the glory of Israel does not lie. He is not, he is not a man. Look it up for yourself. 1 Samuel 15, 29. So I say the first thing is, if you, if you are a Christian or you have any doubts, if what I've said makes any sense to if makes sense to you, turn to Hashem. He loves you and he wants you home. This is the time to absolutely repent. Because can maybe some scribe made a mistake in Matthew and then yes. But lying, changing the word of God, that can't be of God. That has to be of the devil. I'm being straight with you. Now, I want to cut a few points. We really ran out of time, but this is so big. William, with your permission, I want to take a few minutes to touch the parts that... Go ahead. Okay, good. I want to, for a moment, you might be thinking, well, Christians aren't stupid, but how do they respond? These are very serious charges that I have just leveled against Christianity, against the church. If what I've said is correct, if it's accurate, and please read in context, you know, this is... This is the greatest spiritual indictment against Rome, against Christianity. That means Matthew's a liar. This is not a mistake. That means there's a different lie. You might be asking yourself, how do Christians, I mean, they've got to have answers. What will they say? So I want you to do this. I want you to go to your pastor. Please, because I have nothing to fear. So when you tell the truth, I go, go look, right? Let's say you're standing and the, you, you, you show your passport in immigration and the guy looks and says, do you have a driver's license? Because I have to see whatever is your passport, is a, the page is ripped. You don't get nervous. You say, sure, officer. And you reach in your pocket, you open your wallet, and you hand them your driver's license. It all I means you don't have to worry when you're telling the truth. So therefore, do altira, don't be afraid. Let me explain to you. There are... There are a number of responses, and I will address them. I do cover this extensively in my book. I'm not trying to sell books, but there are many other answers. But this is the main stuff you're going to get from the church. Uh, let's take one that William asked me to share with you, and that is, let's walk this back a moment. Do you recall a moment ago in Isaiah 7:14, the controversial text, it says, Behold, the Lord of his own will give you a sign, okay? 
it says there in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew it says, Lechein yitein Hashem hu lachem ois. Behold, the Lord of his own will give you a sign. Okay? A sign. There's a sign that you're going to be saved. Okay? So Christians will argue, hold on, Rabbi Singer, I think you're going a little too fast here. Your explanation, your fancy schmancy explanation, doesn't hold water. Why? Because if you're telling me that the sign is the maturity of the child, not the birth of the child, as we see in 15 and 16, and in fact there is nothing unusual about the conception, meaning there's nothing miraculous about it, where's your sign? Sign? That's a miracle! If this woman became pregnant through the natural, intimate relationship with her husband, that goes on everywhere in the world. Every baby born to this world is born as a result of the intimate union of a man and a woman, right? So this text says that God will show you a sign. Where is your sign? There's no sign. But if you say that it's referring to Jesus, born of a virgin, born of a virgin, now it all makes sense. After all, a woman who's never been touched or never knew a man and conceives, now you've got a sign. So one argument that she uses is that the fact that the word sign, os, is used here, demonstrate that this has to be a miraculous conception rather than a natural one. Okay, you got the answer? You got the point? Good. So I, I remember, uh, I remember. I, I don't think I ever said this in 23 years, but I did I, I, so I, I'll tell you something that happened in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, Skokie, which is, let's say, a suburb of Chicago, and Chicago is a really a beautiful city. Skokie is a big Jewish community, but it has violent weather, very cold winters, hot summers, big problems. And winds come off of Lake Michigan, and sometimes they can tear out the signs in the streets. It really is a problem. It's a problem not just there, but it's a problem in other cities that have very strong gusts of wind. Imagine you have a stop sign that's there to... Imagine if you went and ripped out stop signs from a street. What would happen? People would get killed. Why? Because the motorist wouldn't stop and cars would be crashing. And that's what happened in Skokie. What happened was there was such big winds coming, snapping off of Lake Michigan that, in fact, the signs would just get ripped out of their, of their foundation and get thrown in the... And this was a big problem. The big problem is no stop sign, you have dead motorists. This is not brain surgery. So the, the, the uh, city council of Skokie gathered together, the engineers gathered together, they had to solve this. How can we ensure that signs don't get blown out of their thing? Because if you don't have stop signs at an intersection, that means you have dead people. It's, there's an imperative, this, a solution has to be come. And they're coming up with different ideas. How will they build a sign, the foundation, how will they make sure it doesn't get blown down, and everyone's coming up with ideas. Along comes one schmendrick, meaning little guy in the back who goes, I got the solution. I have the solution so that we will never again have a problem in this town where signs will be blown down. And it's quiet, and everyone turns to him and goes, well, what's your solution? How can you be so sure? They say, he says, it's not a problem. What's the reason why signs are getting blown down? Because stop signs have, uh, you know, they're big flat surfaces. They offer a lot of resistance to winds. He says, all you have to do, dummies, is bury the entire sign from top to bottom underground. Bury the whole thing underground. Then the wind will just fly above, will pass above it because it's submerged underground. And then no sign in Skokie will ever be torn down, and then we'll never have to replace another sign in Skokie. Right, exactly. And everyone's going, uh, you are the biggest idiot that ever walked on two feet. What's the problem with this solution? It's obvious. If you bury the sign underground, then <laughs> no one can see it. Now listen carefully. If you can't see it, it's not a sign. Got it? As it turns out in Hebrew, there's a word, os. Os does not mean a miracle. Os means a sign. A sign means something that you can see. As it turns out, the, 
The earliest signs in the Bible in Genesis are not miraculous. Rainbows. Is a rainbow a miracle? Well, if you went to school, you know it's not a miracle. It's water particles in the atmosphere, and the sun passes through, and it breaks it down to the colors of the prism. We all have done this. Now, is a rainbow a sign? Is a rainbow a miracle? No. Can you see it? You bet you can. And there was a sign that God will never bring the flood. I give you a hundred examples. So therefore, an oath is something that you can see. Does it mean that a something you can see is not a miracle? No. It's just not related to miracles. It might be miraculous or not miraculous. But what is this something you can see? Now, here's the key point. If what Isaiah had in view here is that a woman never touched by a man would conceive, I'm going to ask you a question. How is this a sign? A sign has to be something you can see. It may be miraculous or may not be miraculous, but it must be a person should be able to see that to see it. You have to see the rainbow. I want to ask you a question. Let's say it's talking about Mary. I'll just concede everything to make the point. Let's say this is talking about Mary who never slept with a man in her life. No man touched her. Good. As it, she's married to a man named Joseph, and she ultimately gets pregnant has a baby. And here's the baby. Can you see a virgin birth? That would be a miracle, or close to a miracle. It's, uh, it's called parthenogenesis. But let's just say they do have whales that, you know, so, or sharks. That's, uh, but let's just say it's a miracle. Well, it's fine, it's a miracle. I can see that, certainly, it would be. But if, in fact, a virgin conceived, the virgin is married, conceived, and has a baby, how can you see a virgin birth? A, the birth of a virgin to a baby is not a sign. It would be a miracle, which is a mo-face. It can't be a sign. Why? What do you see in the child in the birthing room that looks any different than any other birth? You can't, by definition, a virgin birth can't be a sign because you can't see it. It's a miracle for sure, if it would be. Actually, this is not true because Matthew has change the word of God, but again, I want to set that aside. So, just understand, you're going to get this. There is a word for miracle. A virgin birth would be a miracle. And by the way, if you know anything about science, an old woman like Sarah conceiving is a much bigger miracle than a virgin conceiving. Why? Because if a, a, a woman is born with every egg, a girl, baby girl is born with every egg she'll ever have. Every egg. Uh, not a man. A man's sperm is, is made by a factory. So if a girl, woman runs out of eggs, there is, she can't have a baby if she has no eggs. So therefore, the virgin birth is, not, is actually the, the birth of a, the, the conception of, of Yitzchak, Isaac, to Sarah is a, is a much bigger miracle scientifically than a virgin conceiving technically. You know, it happens in the animal world rarely, but it can happen. So that's the point. Now, there's one other argument, and with that, we'll close this, and we'll continue next week. The other argument that you'll hear up and down is that Matthew was using what's called the Septuagint. And I have to cover this, because if you go to any Christian uh, apologist, Bible, they'll all tell you this. If I don't tell you this, you're going to walk away confused. They're going to say, all right. I granted that, that the word Alma is not your typical word for virgin, but as it turned out, Matthew was relying on the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Bible. And the, at, when was the Septuagint written? Missionaries will argue some 2,200 years ago. Who wrote it? Some 70, 72 great learned rabbis, which we do know about when Josephus. And if you look at the Greek in Isaiah 7, 14, lo and behold, the word Alma, this Hebrew word, is translated by the rabbis of old into the word Parthenos. And Parthenos, a Greek, means a virgin. Let's just say, for it's not really technically correct, but let's just concede it because I want to make my point. Okay, you got it? The, there's, if you get on the phone after this show and call up any pastor, that's answer number one. Septuagint. This is the biggest lie that ever walked on two feet. But you won't know it because it, this is the kind of answer that at first glance sounds believable and sounds plausible, but if you dig and then dig a little further, you realize it is completely fatuous and it's bogus. The Septuagint, the original Septuagint, translated by the 70 72 rabbis for a for the for the Alexandrian library, it 
did not survive, but it was only the five books of Moses. This is universally known. Open any Septuagint in the world, the introduction will tell you. I don't care if this Septuagint was published by by the Church of Christ, Jesus, Mary, Christos, whatever. No, it going at the, the original Septuagint, which we don't have, was destroyed in a fire, is, was not Isaiah. It was only the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. What we have is later Greek translations, and there were, including the, the Christian translators, done by Origen and others. They changed, they created or crafted Greek translations to comport to support the the Christological, not errors, this is not an error, crimes against the Jewish Bible. So this is a, a patent lie. Don't buy the Septuagint because it's nonsense. I know we're running out of time, but one other point. Why would Matthew be looking at a Septuagint? You've seen Rembrandt's picture of Matthew. An angel is talking into his ear. Christians believe that the book of Matthew was not the work of a man, but rather the work of the Holy Ghost. Are you telling me that God had to consult a Greek translation of the Bible because he forgot how to speak Hebrew? How foolish is such a claim? How silly is such a claim? So the, 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 I cover, I, I'm not trying to sell books. There are, I have many videos where I cover this point, and, but know this, and please, Jews have nothing to worry about. If you have the truth, nothing to worry about. Go to your pastor, check it, check it, and check it again, and then turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because his arms are open to you, and may the return of the world's nations bring about the coming of the true Mashiach quickly in our time. Thank you for joining me. Adon Olach, Asher Malach, בחף צוקו, אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא, ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו, אם לא כנועה, והוא היה, והוא עובר והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחפצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוף נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחפצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוף נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת עשה וחפצו כל עשה עם מלך, עשה עם מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם לוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כחלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כחלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא בחפצה כל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא בחפצה כל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה